So this talk is really about pixels. It's not about words, it's not about semantics, it's about what we can infer from the pixels of an image, say, uh, or from the pixels of a, of a video. Now, I work at the Open University, a uh, university with 260,000 students, uh, but none on campus. Uh, so that's uh, distance learning. And the Knowledge Media Institute uh, was founded at this university basically as a corporate research institute to help uh, knowledge media along. So knowledge media are uh, media that help us understand stuff as opposed to entertainment. Um, entertainment media. So we are project-oriented. Uh, high proportion, two-thirds of our income comes from external funding. Uh, we do lots of projects and in the last 20 years we've probably uh, done around about 150 uh, external funded projects and um, so that's we are 80 staff uh, roughly. So that's the context in which this research happens. Uh, and this is what I'd like to, to talk about today. Uh, I'd like to talk about near duplicate detection. Um, that's finding stuff within images that's, that's known, finding known patterns. Uh, that's the easy bit, uh, nearly solved. Um, later, we'll switch to machine learning and computer vision. So it's an interesting. A set of in, in, interesting intersection to be had between these two disciplines. And uh, in the end, uh, I'll look a little bit into media understanding. Now, I've got one problem here. The, um, the projection is not, uh, is not full, so um, it's, it's clipped at the, at the bottom, so something is not quite right here. Is there a way to change the, the format? There is more on my slides than, than is projected here. Well, if not, we'll run with it and uh, we'll, we'll... Oh, no, no, no. Thank you very much for that. Brilliant technical team. Thank you. So, um, so here is what, what's near duplicate detection. That's a cool access mode. So that's a book I've uh, written a couple of years ago and uh, you might come across it somewhere and want to know more about it. Uh, you could conceivably pop out your smartphone, uh, put an app on, SnapTel, uh, that knows about book and CD covers, uh, take a photograph with that app, and it can be wonky and blurry, uh, the letters don't even have to be recognizable on, on there, uh, and, and then this is an inverse lookup where you find information about this thing. So it finds that book in the database from the photograph, uh, tells you about the reviews, raving reviews, how good the book is, how little it costs, and with one more click, you can buy that, uh, that book. So what we've done here is we've linked the real world with a photograph to a database, to information about uh, this thing. And that's quite an interesting technique to be able to do. Uh, lots, of, lots of applications. Uh, you can think of a museum, you can uh, think of different applications. One is we've developed a similar app uh, to identify <clears throat> all the artwork at the Open University, a large campus, one square kilometer, and uh, uh, um, hundreds and hundreds of artworks scattered over the campus. So the same technology you can use for that particular uh, uh, thing. Uh, or, you might for, um, or you might use it to link slides that you might have somewhere to videos where someone talks about this slide. Uh, so you, you, you find a slide, you struggle with it as a student, but you know there are three or four videos. Um, and it's just too cumbersome to A, find the video and then find where in this video uh, this, this context is being talked about. Uh, but this technology allows you to link one medium to another medium um, and to, to gain entry points for your teaching media, for example. Now, near-duplicate detection is a technique that works well in two dimensions. 
So oh, it works well for wine labels. You photograph a wine label and you, you know how good this wine is. See reviews about it. Uh, it doesn't work so well in near 2D. That's the cases that have two-dimensional surfaces, like buildings or vases, but that are not really two-dimensional. Uh, and it doesn't really work well in three dimensions, uh, faces and, and uh, quite changeable um, structures. They, they are not amenable to that technology. Um, so, um, I, I'd, I'd like to show a, f a few techniques how this works, uh, so we can understand uh, how this technique scales up to millions of covers, uh, to millions of objects, which certainly near duplicate detection does. So, it's, it's, a sort of <clears throat> it's a sort of fingerprinting technique where you have a few steps. Um, one of the things that always is done in these fingerprinting techniques is you find salient points. Salient points are um, elements of, a, of an image that are not easily destroyed by bad lighting or by the way you, do, you take the photograph uh, or by uh, the orientation, how you take the photographs or, or by the colors. So salient points are strong points that kind of stand out in an image. Uh, the next step is to compute a feature vector. That's how we call that, that our characteristics around that point. And then you make that invariant to rotation and scaling. So you find it when the camera is rotated or the angle of view is a little bit different. Uh, the next step, however, is crucial. Uh, once you have these features, they normally are, that's the way that computer vision people work, they normally are vectors in a high dimensional space. But once you find them, uh, quantizing them creates, a, creates an opportunity to index them as if they were words. So in fact, in our research, we treat these, these quantized feature vectors as words. Um, or as uh, natural language processing people perhaps uh, would use words. Uh, we call them actually vis terms. That, um, allows us to use techniques such as text search engines to retrieve them from large data sets. So that's the, that's the key ingredient in order to be able to scalable uh, to millions or even billions of images. Uh, and then uh, another trick which is not on this, on this slide is that each object is characterized uh, by a few hundred of those vis terms. And because it's a few hundred, uh, if, say, half of them is destroyed by the way we took the photograph uh, or by slight changes in the environment, um, it doesn't so much matter because it's the correlation, the co-occurrence of the remaining 100 that is then indicative of this very object being actually in this particular picture. Uh, and once we find a hundred, say, of, of candidate objects, sorry, a uh, uh, hundred candidate points that signify an object, we might want to enforce spatial constraints uh, or check whether spatial constraints are there. So to give an example, um, here is a picture of the entrance of um, my university. Uh, so certain type of features that has been extracted here, the red dots, SIFT features, very well known in computer vision, um, not the subject of this lecture though. And these, these uh, feature points, there will be a few hundred per picture, and if you have a million of pictures, you'll have 100 million of these feature points. They all live in a high dimensional space, and this feature space in this feature space, these fe feature points will cluster somehow. And uh, that's a technique that we use in order to create the vis terms. Uh, we create clusters of these 100 million of, of feature vectors, and each cluster gets a name, an artificial gobbledygook name. You could number them one to three. Uh, here, I've chosen just some, some uh, other words for it. Now, these, these uh, will be 
uh, pseudoterms that express the type of features that are there in images, and that then later can be used in order to uh, do the fingerprinting of, of objects. One thing that we need to be able to do is we need to be able to cluster very fast. And 2006 were the first um, clustering algorithms that, that work on this, um, high, uh, on, on, on this large amount of, of, of vectors in a reasonable, qu quite uh, quick time. So there is hierarchical k-means uh, that's been used for that purpose. Uh, there are other me methods to do the clustering. Uh, Locality-sensitive hashing is one of them. Uh, all of these have the property that they are very quick and allow good quantization. Now, with that in hand, uh, a picture like that can be represented by gobbledygook text. Text that represents where each word represents one of those uh, points that were found to be salient, found to be particularly useful in describing this, this image. And uh, a query then looks like this text. Uh, you, can you can transform all of your images in your database into uh, this text and then query with one text document against a series of other text documents. And that's the trick, the quantization here is the trick uh, for scalability. Uh, as we all know, the Googlers of this world uh, managed to index the whole World Wide Web, and in the same way, we were able to index uh, one million or one billion of images uh, using these quantized terms. Now, here is a query that is a logo, um, and we find that logo in, in one of these slides, one of, one of these pictures. Uh, and one thing that we can always uh, try to do is we can try to see whether close-by points in the query end up by being mapped to close-by points in the, uh, in the target image. And if that's the case, that's the, uh, that's the spatial constraints that I mentioned earlier, then um, the, the, the correlation of all these points all but ensures us that the, the uh, query that we have on the left-hand side somehow appears in one of those images. So that's, um, th that's the, the standard technique that's been used for roughly 10 years uh, in order to do near-duplicate detection uh, well. And, and th these techniques increasingly better, incre work increasingly uh, better. So it's almost a solved problem here. So that's uh, to reflect back on what we've seen. Um, and here is an application of that technique, not in images, but in audio. Um, here is audio represented as a spectrogram. The x-axis is time, uh, the y-axis is frequency, and the color represents the energy that happens at a particular point in time of this audio piece um, in a particular uh, frequency. So we can see that um, a lot of frequencies are expressed in, um, a lot of frequencies are expressed at the same time. Uh, so for those of you who are audio engineers, you might be able to read that. You might be able to, to guess what it represents. It's uh, five seconds of, uh, of a certain sound. Um, and I can play the sound to you in, in order to give you an, an oral. <laughs> Yes, thank you. That's woken everyone up, right? So that's the lightsabers of Star Wars. Um, so that's this, this audio piece. Now, um, the, the trick here in order to recognize that amongst the 
100,000 hours of, uh, of audio is to treat this as an, as an image and use the same techniques that we've seen before uh, with salient points and then use those in order to recognize that as a fingerprint. And that's how, uh, that's basically how Shazam works. Uh, some of you will have used that app, uh, an app that allows you, while you, while you sit as a passenger in a car and listen to the radio, to, to record a few seconds of, uh, of a song that you hear in the radio, and that will identify uh, the, uh, the piece to you, um, to, uh, despite the fact that you have background noise and despite the fact that your, that your mobile phone uh, microphone might not be very good. Okay, so, so that concludes uh, this, this part. Um, the principal techniques for near duplicate detection, uh, they, they still benefit from uh, development in the features that you can use to extract. So most features that have been looked at so far work with photographs, uh, but I've also done some work with with colleagues and, and, um, uh, and, and sketches on, on shapes, where we try to identify uh, features that particularly make use of the boundaries of objects, uh, particularly make use of the shape of things. And uh, so he, uh, here is, uh, here is uh, one thing we, we make use of. A uh, definition of medialness. Now, uh, here is an, an outline of, um, of some object. That's the, the bean type of shape here. And for each point within this, within this shape, <clears throat> we construct a, a circle that touches the, um, touches the boundary. And here we, do it, <coughs> here we do that at a point that touches two sets of, uh, of, of boundaries. Uh, so it touches not only once, but twice. And uh, then we take, a, uh, we, we take the radius a little bit larger, we increase the radius by epsilon, and we look at the support that lies within this ring around that point, the support given by the shape. Uh, and the length, of, the length of this line um, is something that uh, is, is, is uh, something that we call medialness of that point with respect to that shape. Now, with uh, with the medialness of each point within the shape, and here is an example. <clears throat> we can we, we can see that in the middle, the equidistant points to the boundary, uh, the medialness is highest, and. Um, when we take away some of the, uh, some of the tail off um, with the so-called top hat function, only a spine remains. So that's the skeletal representation of shape. And when we look at maxima of the medialness along that shape, you'll find points of significance. Uh, these points are what we call dominant points. And whenever you take circles around the dominant points uh, that touch the boundary, you'll be able to reconstruct that object. And in fact, there are artists who construct the sketches in those circle type of movements uh, and, and create their, their cartoon-like figures with that. Now, we, we use those uh, dominant points to create uh, invariant feature vectors. Um, <coughs> So that's a, a new type of competing feature vector for describing salient points within images. Um, here is, uh, so, so, we, we use, so we use the notion of the, the support that the boundary gives us around a circle. Uh, these are these circle fragments here. And we transform that into a binary feature vector that kind of represents uh, the boundary at a certain point uh, in, in that way. Now, with those, with those uh, shape feature vectors, we can then uh, do the same game of near duplicate detection uh, 
very well for all sketch-based uh, type of retrieval or for all uh, things where the boundaries of objects are of particular significance. And so one way to, to prove how well this works would be in cartoons. That's what we have done. Um, now we've, we've looked into uh, how well this feature vector works against other known feature vectors uh, for near duplicate detection. Um, and we've chosen uh, videos of The Simpsons uh, in order to, to prove that point. Uh, so to, to give you an... To give you an example, uh, here we're looking for, for Bart. Bart is the character here, top left. That's the query. And we try to find where in, uh, where in the cartoon does this figure appear. And, and of course, you look at keyframes of, uh, of many, many hours of, of this cartoon series. And we, while we use the SIFT feature vector, we see that uh, all sorts of uh, matches happen. Uh, so that's not a particularly good feature vector for that. Uh, related ones surf, um, for those of you who do computer vision will know that it's, uh, uh, no one in literature does equally bad. Uh, but taking this dedicated shape feature uh, then allows us a much easier, a much more uh, precise uh, matching of objects within video streams. Um, particularly well when, when this is uh, sketch-based or, uh, uh, or outline-based. Now the same for Lisa. Here is SIFT, here is SURF, and here our feature vector uh, and MARGE. The same story here. Okay, so, so um, progress in that area in, in near-duplicate detection has been made, uh, is, continues to be made, on uh, creating better feature vectors and creating uh, more, rob more robust ways of matching uh, things. So, in that sense, um, we've already made some progress. We've, we've been able to identify objects within, um, within pictures or within videos, uh, even though they might appear deformed or with different lighting uh, or uh, in, in a different pose. And that's useful for generic analysis. Um, the, the, the much more difficult uh, problem comes when you don't look for a specific object, but when you look for a class of objects. So while it is very easy to find a specific car, it's uh, more difficult to find the general concept of, of car uh, within a scene. Um, and those of you who have tried, it's, uh, it's sometimes quite hard, for example, to predict that there is a chair in, in an image. The difficulty arises from um, the fact that there are so many different chairs. Uh, so many different types, not only the color, of course the color is different, but also the form, uh, the number of legs, the way it's shaped. Uh, that's, that's all very, very different. There's a huge variability um, in, in that. So we once had a project where we tried to find seating possibilities for blind people, to alert blind people where they could rest. Uh, and, and so I have a, a small... Uh, a small shoulder variable camera, a webcam, uh, that would then be able to somehow tell uh, a blind person with voice uh, where they could find a place. But that's, that's, that's rather hard. It's not, it's not so hard to find a particular chair. So if you, you, you can very easily, with a near duplicate detection, train um, a system to find a particular chair in the, uh, say, in, in, the, in the house, in the living room room of, uh, of a blind person. Uh, but to find, in the, in the wild, to find any kind of uh, seating opportunity, that's quite, quite hard. And the step that's needed here is one of machine learning, one of generalization. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be showing two examples of machine learning in images. 
uh, in, in the next uh, few minutes. One is about how to judge the aesthetics of photographs. That's something where you and I wouldn't be able to agree, perhaps. Uh, so that's an interesting task for a machine to do. And another one is about food analysis. Uh, that's a, just a preliminary, preliminary study, um, not, not a full-fledged study. And that leads on to the next step, which is even more difficult, uh, the, the step of media understanding. So how, how can computers understand the world by watching, for example, TV? Well, I'm not sure humans can understand the world by watching TV, but that's a different thing. Okay. Uh, so, what's a good photograph? That's the, that's the question that we've posed here. Uh, here is one where a lot of people agree that's a good photograph, and uh, 180 people have given it, on average, 6.6 .6 points out of 10, um, in, in terms of how they uh, like the aesthetics of that photograph. And uh, so, here is an example of not-so-good photographs, uh, which have... Uh, a much, much lower, um, have gained a much lower assessment. Well, it's, it's quite easy to see, uh, but it's, it's, for us it's quite easy to see, but for, for computers it's not so, not so easy. So, um, so that's the research questions that we had. Is it possible to extract image aesthetics uh, automatically? And how well can machine learning methods perform on this particular task? And how can we evaluate that? Now, uh, so we went back to photographic principles. So we tried to figure out which features uh, exist that photographs, or fo so that, sorry, that photographers would say are indicative of a good photograph. So simplicity is one. Um, or the use of complementary colors is another one. Uh, low contrast, uh, photographers tell us, uh, helps for a, for a, a good picture, uh, and high contrast, they tell us, also helps for good pictures. Um, then rule of thirds, we've heard about that, the use of golden ratio, uh, or the use of diagonals. So th these are all principles that uh, we, we, we learn from, from actual people, who judge photographs or who take photographs and pride themselves in doing so. Uh, so the so, um, question is, how can we uh, teach a, a, an automated system? Maybe that then is in the next version of your camera that, that alerts you to whether or not an image is, is any good. Uh, or once you've taken a series of images, that tells you which one of them is best. Uh, here's blur, blur, another. So, so, so the question is, how, how, good, how good is this picture, for example, which I spent yesterday all six seconds on, taking on my way back to the hotel? Um, is, and so you would expect the system to come up with a score or maybe with a rationale on uh, why this is good or had it taken a series of those pictures, which one of those is best? So uh, we, we took all sorts of uh, global features known to computer vision that can be computed easily on uh, one million or, or five million uh, pixels. Um, and we tried to come up with features that express what photographers, what photographers uh, think is important for, for pictures. Um, and so that's another sack of uh, features that we extract from images. And uh, what we th did then is, uh, after selecting a data set with ground truth, so we, we happened to select this particular one with 16,500 uh, pictures. So what we did then is we, we used uh, a number of machine learning methods from Arda Boost support vector machines to random forest to, to then figure out which of those uh, features that we, we can easily compute correlates best with the, with the high quality, with the high perceived quality of a photograph. Um, and it turned out that by, by doing so, we find 
first of all, a set of uh, features that can be used. Uh, and it turned out that you can actually teach a system to perceive uh, the aesthetics of an, of an image uh, rather well, at least um, with respect to what the average of 100 users thinks about that. And then here is a, a small table that evidences that. Uh, so we've uh, compared the work in our project against that of uh, competitors. And, um, and the left column tells us what's the recall of aesthetically pleasing images when the precision is 0.99. Um, and in comparison to that, our system uh, managed to find a high proportion of those images that actually are um, that actually are, are being judged as aesthetically pleasing, and when we take and we look at um, at the recall of 0.81 and, and look at the precision of, of the competing systems, uh, these this is market, markedly lower. So the success here comes about by doing. Um, um, by, by doing a combination of machine learning methods and, and uh, using a large set of, uh, of features that is, then, um, that is then studied in order to figure out which one of those features correlates best with the perceived aesthetics. Now, um, similar, uh, I, I would like to do similar research in food analysis and I can report on the first preliminary uh, studies on that. Um, so so the, here is the idea. Um, you're only allowed to eat something once you've taken a photograph of what you've eaten. So that gives you a, a food log of, of your intake. And if your phone has run out of battery, uh, you cannot eat. Yeah? You have to recharge your phone first, uh, take your picture, and then you can eat. So once you've done, once you've... Uh, once you've started doing a serious food log, the next question, of course, is what, is, um, what can we learn from that? Um, the question would be about, uh, for example, do we, have, do we get the balance right, the balance of different food types? The uh, question is, do we get... Um, uh, do we get a good insight? Perhaps can can even measure the volume of of stuff that we eat, or perhaps even guess the type of calories or the amount of calories that, that we uh, eat. And uh, here a student of, of mine uh, has done a food log, uh, so that's different diet, I suppose, to what I would be able to, uh, to survive on. Uh, and done a preliminary study into trying to differentiate with automated means, brownies from sandwiches and spaghetti from pizza and, and, and pancakes. Uh, sounds like an easy task, uh, and in some extent it is an easy task. Um, uh, here's some, some feature extraction for that. And, and so a preliminary study shows, yeah, we, you're able to, uh, to recognize most of that. Here's a confusion matrix. So sometimes the pizza is being confused for eggs and beans, and sometimes the sandwich is being confused for a pizza inexplicably. inexplicably. Um, so then we, um, then we widen that to a larger set of, of, uh, of food. And again, so this, this is uh, here fruit only. So to try to differentiate different uh, sort of fruit. Of fruit. Um, and the diagonal here is also nicely expressed. But again, uh, sometimes computer algorithms make mistakes. So mis mistake a pear for a banana or mistake... Uh, blueberries for olives, or who would have thought that? Apples uh, with, with olives. Um, I'm sure this can be done much better, and I'm sure we, we can automate that, this type of, uh, of uh, food log uh, much better. Uh, but there you go, these are only preliminary studies. Um, but this is, uh, in, in some sense, it's really difficult to instill um, to, ins to instill a sense of a sense of the, the objects for a sense of the type of objects uh, for automated 
uh, computation. Now, the next step, uh, once, uh, once machine learning works for certain kinds of questions, uh, the next step would then be to try and do some media understanding. And uh, media understanding, so automated media understanding, I mean, is, is really difficult because of the huge variety of the types of, uh, of uh, images that there can be. So here is a small random subset of uh, figures that you find in patent applications. So I'm only looking at figures in patent applications. But still there, you find such a big variety uh, of, of stuff. You find chemical formulae, you, you find flow charts, um, so flow diagrams for, for, uh, for programs, for software. Um, you find mechanical drawings or electric, uh, electromechanical drawings. Um, you find formulae, uh, which for some, for, for some reason get sometimes typeset as, as figures, uh, and so on. So it's a mind-boggling um, diversity of figures. And that's just figures in patents, in patent applications. And each of them has its own language, has its own rules, its own meanings. Um, each of them come with their own uh, domain ontology. So, um, so one thing I'm trying to work on is uh, to create a visual language. So we've seen that uh, it's relatively easy to extract vis terms. That's what I introduced at the beginning of the talk. And ontologies help us to make sense of the world on the high end. So once we've identified material, for example, grass, tarmac, and sky, um, or, or visual objects, as I said before, bananas and, and apples, um, maybe we can conclude more complex objects out of that. Uh, barbecues, for example, where people are eating stuff, and maybe it's grass around. Uh, or uh, ontologies help us to, to create um, abstract concepts, victory, triumph, all, all that kind of thing. And, and so there's a gap here, a gap between those vis terms and, and those concrete things, and that's where uh, part of my research comes in, to try to generate a visual language to bridge that gap. And so the hope is that at some point uh, we'll be able to let computers watch television and computers not only build up a knowledge base, uh, but also sense how the world is around us. Sense from the co-occurrence of uh, two different political leaders that maybe the countries are friends uh, or um, are in the, in the same, uh, same political aspirations. And uh, uh, maybe a system then uh, will be able to figure out how, um, how, this world, um, how this world is built in terms of sentiment, of uh, protests that, that we see uh, on television um, and, and, other, and other things. And maybe we could, even, we could even deduce the political structure of a, of a single one country if, for example, every time the, uh, uh, the news are about politics of that country, the leader of that country is being shown uh, in, 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 on, on television, as happens uh, with Putin, for example. Whenever, whenever there's policy in Russia, there's always a picture of Putin that comes up. So, so all these things, they might be learned, might be gleaned automatically, uh, but that's for the future to come. Uh, so that's, that's all I wanted to uh, talk about today. And uh, here are some conclusions that I offer. Your duplicate detection is simple, works well, uh, has, has neat applications. Machine learning is much harder but promising. And automated media understanding, certainly a long way to go. Well, thank you for your patience and for your audience.